Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, it's uh, special to have you, and I appreciate you accommodating Thank you. our schedule to uh, do it on Monday instead of Tuesday just for this week. And next week, we're going to resume to the um, Tuesday schedule again. Let's see if this works. Yeah. We call it the Great Concealment. Um, this is going to be quite interesting. We're going to introduce something this evening, which is traced to the Lurianic Kabbalah. That's the Kabbalah, the way it's taught by the Arizal. But in order to put it in a way that we can all understand, I'm going to start with some questions. Even though these questions seem as if they're totally unrelated to what we've learned until now, but by the end of the lesson you will see how it fits right in. And question number one is, how do we deal with adversity? Um, adversity could be challenges that we have in our personal life. It could be challenges that we have in our family life. It could be challenges that we have in our communal life. Or it could be challenges that we have as a society. Uh, many people today will say that the Jewish people are fa facing adversity because of what's taking place in Israel. And not that I want to get off on that right now, but it is a adversarial kind of um, engagement. Um, and it sometimes causes us to feel down. Like, how are we going to get out of this? When you see so many people that have a misinformed or misshaped uh, idea that they believe is their ideal, and you're fighting for life and you're fighting for light, how is that? How do you deal with that? Why don't you fall apart and just crumble? Um, and the other question is, why is it that God created the world in such a way that he brings us these kinds of challenges? Because uh, life is full of challenges for every person. And if you look at the Jewish people, the journey of the Jewish people over the last few thousand years has been very, very challenging. So, as you know, in Judaism, whenever you ask a question, you answer it with another question, like the proverbial joke that somebody was asked, why do you always answer with a question? And he said, why not? So, <laughs> there is a question. So, let's get to the question. And once we get to this other major question, we will sort of start seeing the whole puzzle come uh, together for us in a brilliant, put together, orchestrated, coordinated way. So the question is here. Over the last few uh, lessons, we talked about certain kinds of issues in Judaism. Like, for instance, we spoke about Ein Sof. God's infinity. That was the lesson that we spoke about Keter, if you remember, when we connected it to desire. It was lesson number three. Um, Ein Sof means that God is, the light that emanates from God is infinite. We also spoke about the ten Sfirot. The ten Sfirot is the way the divine light manifests itself in a very defined manner of ten specific divine attributes, and we've seen pictures of these divine attributes organized in three columns, right? We talked about a God consciousness, which means that something which is called Elokut, it is called godly, it's called God. Like, for instance, the world of Atzilut, where the ten attributes are actually uh, present, but the world of Atzilut is a God conscious world. I'm, I'm just reviewing very briefly items and concepts that we talked about before, because I'm not just trying to do a review, I'm trying to come up with a question. We also spoke in the very first class about the three spiritual worlds called Bia in acronym, Bria, Yitzir, and Asiya. Bria is actually, we'll start reverse. Asiya is, do you want to close that door over there? Sorry, because there's, there's a lot of activities going on in our building, thank God. So Asiya is the world of action, which is the lowest. Uh, above that is Yitzira, which is formation. And above that is Bria, which is creation, which we gave the example of action, speech, and thought going from the bottom up. 
But that is, those are worlds that, even though they are um, subservient to God, especially the word of Greek, the word of Greek is totally subservient to God. But yet on the other hand, even though they're subservient to God, um, they have their own consciousness. It's called Yeshut. They have their own feeling. That's what we come to Yeshut, existing with self-awareness and independence. So where do I get to the question? The question is about the ship. Let me, let's talk about the ship. Let's say you're taking a class in American history and you're examining what the, this country looked like in 1750 with all the colonies that were here and what the process of government was like. We were basically a British colony. Um, learn about the landowners, learn about the taxes and all of, all of the issues that were facing people that lived in the colonies at that time. And let's say you take a leap from 1750 to 1815, you learn about what government, what the landscape of the United States was like then, that you had the three branches of government and you had a certain system where uh, the government sort of interacted with the people, with the various parties and so on and so forth. So if you're going to study it that way, the question that's going to come up is, wait, how did that change? How did it change from the um, the kind of existence? Let me just mute everybody. I'm sorry about that. So, how did it change from a kind of existence where it was the colonies of England, and all of a sudden it's the United States? So you have to talk about the shot was that was heard across the world, right? And that was in Massachusetts, in Lexington, Massachusetts. Some people say Concord. Wherever it was, there was the the Minutemen or whatever you call them. They had this, that's where the revolution started. So you have to talk about the revolution. Without the revolution, you can't talk about the United States the way it is today. So that's called there's a shift from one to another, but the shift didn't happen. Easily, it didn't just blend from British rule into American rule. The Brits didn't come along one day and say, hey, we want to give you a gift and have independence. It came through a war, right? Um, similarly, when we talk about Israel today, um, when Israel, if you talk about Israel the way it was at the turn of the century of the 20th century, and then you look at it in 1955, it's two different Israels in a sense. What happened in between? So we don't even talk about, we need to talk about the shift. But over here, the question of the shift is a much greater question. The crest question of the shift is, how does this happen? And I'm going to give you two examples based on what we learned until now. We're going to start with the harder one, the tougher one, and then the lighter one. The tougher one is right at the beginning of the class tonight, we talked about the Ein Sof, right? The Ein Sof is infinite. Let's remind ourselves what infinite is. Infinite means that the dimensions of finite do not exist within infinity. So if the dimensions of finite don't exist within infinity, numbers, for instance, don't exist in infinity, time doesn't exist within infinity, and space doesn't exist within infinity. So the light that was emanating from God, and we speak about the light that was emanating from God, was called Orin Sof, the way we mentioned it before, was an infinite light. How all of a sudden was there a change from the infinite to finite? We're not talking about God, because God can do whatever he wants. We're talking about in the dimensions of light. What switched it? Where was the shift from infinite to finite? So we talked about Keter and higher than Keter. It was infinity, and it came into finite. How does that happen? I will go even lighter. Atzilut is already finite. It has the, ten, the defined ten spherot. But Atzilut is the God consciousness, right? What does God consciousness mean? There's only the existence of God, no other existence. And all of a sudden, you say the world that comes after that is the world of Bria, where there is our consciousness that comes in. How did that transition take place? All of a sudden, from a God consciousness to something outside of God's consciousness, how could that happen? So this is a question that is addressed 
in um, in Torah. And actually, I have to say that this particular kind of question bothered theologians all the years, but they looked at it from a different way. They looked at it from the perspective of interaction or interfacing. How could the infinite interface with the finite? We're not asking that question because God can do anything he wants. We're asking the question, how did the transition happen when you are living in or when the existence is the existence of infinity and then all of a sudden there is an existence of finite? So the first Kabbalistic scholar to actually address it at great length, and it became he became the standard bearer of this idea, was the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luri. That's why I said earlier the Lurianic Kabbalah. And his Torah was um, recorded by several students, primarily Rabbi Chaim Vital, but also by an other, another student as well. And we will see a little later why it's important to mention both. But we're, we're going to look at what the Arizal says through Rabbi Chaim Vital. This particular reading that we're going to read is so essential that anyone that studies Hasidus knows this particular uh, famous statement. The Rebbe would bring it in many of the discourses. And understanding that helps us understand this transition and why it's so important. So we talked about the order of devolution, the Seder Ishtashus, we spoke about the finite, we spoke about the higher worlds and the lower worlds. But remember, before all that, the only thing that existed was a, the immense light of God that couldn't be measured. It was the infinite light. We know that God desired to create a world, but there was a process. So let's see what Rabbi Chaim Vital says in his famous Sefer, Eitz Chaim, which means the tree of life. Text number one, page 143. Before Atzilut was emanated, now remember, Atzilut is not a creation. It's an emanation because it's an extension of the divine consciousness. That's why it's called Atzilut. We talked about it in lesson number two at great length. The concept that Atzilut is, God, is a world, but it's God's consciousness. But as it is defined through finite. And before the creations were created, so in other words, and, and also before, the next step that came after Atzilut, which was the creations, which was the worlds of Bia, a simple, and remember, I, I don't exactly identify with the word simple. Simple means something that is uncharacterized because it is the purest of pure, pure light, I would say a pure divine light, filled all of reality. So in other words, if there was a reality, now we're not talking about uh, physical space because physical space didn't exist. We're talking about the conceptual idea of existence. Then in the conceptual idea of existence, all that existed was infinite. And that was a divine light that filled all of the reality. It had no aspect of a beginning or an end because it's infinite. Finite has a beginning, it has an end. Infinite doesn't have a beginning, doesn't have an end. That's why it's sometimes referred to as a circle. And that's why on, this, on the screen, you will see the circle. But the circle is just an illustration of something that is endless. Because the circle also has dimensions. It's circular. It's inside the circle, outside the circle. We're not talking about that right now. We're talking about that if there was an existence, the entire existence was permeated with the idea of the reality of the Ein Sof. It is called Ein Sof, the infinite light. Okay, so that was what emanated from the divine, and that was a light that God chose to emanate, not for the purpose of creation, but for the purpose of revealing his own self. It's called the Or Atzmi, the essential light that emanates from God. When it arose in his will to create the worlds, and to emanate at Silut, what did he do? He contracted his infinite light, and an empty space emerged. 
He contracted the infinite light. Now remember, we're going to explain all this. So if it sounds very mystical or Kabbalistic, it's fine. It's meant to be that way. So right now we're just giving you the facts. He contracted, which in the Hebrew is called Tzimtzum. Tzimtzum Atzmahi not didn't contract himself because God cannot be contracted. He contracted the divine light, right? His infinite light. And an empty space emerged. What does an empty space emerge mean? There was the impression as if there was a void. It's called makam panui. Panui, as if it's a it's 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 void. What does that mean? That this space no longer was permeated, or at least the consciousness of the infinite light did not exist in this space. He then projected downward a simple straight line from his circular light. The simple straight line is called a kav. A kav is a small line. We're soon going to see the illustration. Devolving into this empty space. Within this empty space, he first emanated, which is the world of Atzilut. Then he created, which is the world of Bria. Then he fashioned, which is the world of Yitzira. And he made all the worlds, which is the world of the Asiya, where you have all the four, four worlds. This text is a very deep text. It is one of the most complex texts in Kabbalah. But what we're going to do is understand it because this is, explains to us the whole concept. And we're soon going to see that we actually practice Simpson each and every day when we engage with other people. And sometimes we have to practice Simpson for ourselves as well. So if you look at the board, you will see that in the beginning, there was a simple or I would say a pure divine light that fill, filled all the reality. There was no beginning or end. And then there was an interruption. And that was the Tzimtzum. This Tzimtzum enabled a limited projection of godliness to come forth. So, the Orain Saf is the infinite light. That was sort of dismissed. It made... It was made to appear as if it doesn't exist. It was concealed. And then in that void or darkness, a new light projected itself. But that light was very tiny compared to the infinite light. That light was just a straight line. And that line indicates it says a thin line and it was a short line. That line contains in it all these higher worlds, the world of Keter, Tohu, and all the ten spherot, the way or there in Atzilut, or above Atzilut, then in the world of Bria and Asir, and all of the great angels, all of the worlds that we talk about are in this line. Anything that's in the circular is not even in the context of our conversation because it's not a world, it's only the presence of the divine. When you think about it, you realize that we are only a tiny speck, or not even a tiny speck, compared to the divine. Now, I want to um, introduce you. Are we following this so far? Okay. Now I want to introduce you to a word here, which is very, very important, that in Tzimtzum itself, there are generally three kinds of Tzimtzum. We're going to start from the bottom up. There is a Tzimtzum, which is its con its uh, only purpose is to conceal. So if somebody is nudging you for information or you don't want to give them information, or you're not in the mood of talking to them, somebody you don't want to have a relationship with, and they come, hey, can you tell me what happened? What's going on? So you give them a riddle. You give them a little bit of piece of information here or there, but you're actually concealing more than you're revealing. And that is symptom for the purpose of concealment. Um, then there is Tzimtzum for the purpose of revelation. What is Tzimtzum for the purpose of revelation? Tzimtzum for the purpose of revelation is that if you need to convey a piece of information and the person cannot understand it the way you understand it, so you have to condense it and contract it so that the person should be able to understand it. So let's say you have two people that are intellectual, but one is not trained in the particular um expertise or discipline that you're trained so one is a philosopher and the other one is a engineer right so a philosopher doesn't know much about engineering but a philosopher is not 
not dumb, not stupid, it has a brain. So he asks the engineer questions, and the engineer, in order for the engineer to be able to explain the concepts that he's dealing with in his uh, language, he has to condense it and bring it out to their level so that they should be able to understand it. He'll use several examples until, or he'll use, um, not examples, he'll use illustrations and explain it so that he can understand it. So there's a certain element of tzimtzum, but the reason of the tzimtzum that he's condensing it is not for the sake of concealing the information. It's not for the sake of hiding the information and not sharing it with you, but rather it's for the sake of revealing it to you. But the only way to reveal it to you is through tzimtzum, right? Then in that tzimtzum for the revelation, there is a deeper level of tzimtzum. And the deeper level of tzimtzum is when you are putting two people together that are are total opposites as far as their intellectual capacity. So you can have Einstein or Aristotle or Sir Isaac Newton, right? Or Maimonides, if we want to speak about a great Jewish intellect, or Nachmanides. And they're sitting down with a, a young uh, group of kids and want to explain a concept to them. And the way they understand their particular ideas and philosophies is infinitely greater than what the young, what the person can understand. So then, in order for them to do it, they have to go through a different kind of tzimtzum. And the tzimtzum over there is a tzimtzum where they first conceal everything. They And we're soon going to see some examples of that, where they basically um, remove the richness of their idea, and they find some way of explaining a little teeny bit of it so that the younger people should have some sort of grasp of it. So they're not giving them false information. They're giving them correct information, but it is so condensed that the only way to condense it is if the intellect hides everything that's in his mind and allows that particular finite idea to come through. We're going to discuss and develop this idea even more. We're going to see it in the video in a minute. But that's the uniqueness of Simpson Arishan, because in Simpson Arishan, that had to be the total concealment. Why? Because Simpson Arishan, the jump and the shift was from infinite to finite. Even though the finite compared to us is infinite, it's so great, but in the true dimensions of what they are, it's a jump from infinite to finite. To jump from inf infinite to finite, finite cannot exist in the presence of infinity. Okay. What? What? Finite cannot exist in the presence of infinity, because it doesn't have. Take for instance, the simple, the the classic example is if you take a flame of a candle and you um, bring it out during this in, in a on a sunny day, you can't see it. So even though it exists but it doesn't have its own identity. In, in here, it's even more. Finite cannot be present in infinity unless it's within God. And we're going to soon see how that works. It does work a little bit within our minds as well, as we're soon going to see, but I'm just giving you the general idea. So Tzimtzum Arishan is different than any other Tzimtzum. When it comes from jumping from Atzilut to Bria, which Atzilut is finite and Bria is also find it, it's just that this is God's consciousness, and this is not. Over there, it's a regular symptom, and actually there's another process. We'll soon see what it is. But in the first symptom, it's called symptom erision. So when you talk about symptom erision, there is the total act of concealment when there's a total concealment that allows for the finite light to become visible and to be drawn in. Okay. The finite light in the terms of Kabbalah is called Kav. The literal translation of Kav, even in modern Hebrew, is a line, as we saw in the illustration before. And that indicates a very finite light. It's a very limited light. And that's where the spherot are. Now, what I must say is this. Before we go on to explain this whole concept, I'm not, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but a little bit of time. Um it's absolutely important that when we talk about the this concept and we're actually going to bring examples that we don't apply physical 
um, attributes to it because we're talking about God. We're not talking about human beings. So if we're using a human being as an example, it's only in the concept of what it means, but it's not the same way at all. Because, for instance, someone is chatting, so we'll see what it is. Is our world an illusion? No, our world is not an illusion, but it's a very good question because it's actually brought in Hasidut. And if our world was an illusion, there wouldn't be Torah and Mitzvah. Our world is not an illusion. Let's get through this, this uh, the next few words. Now, the reason we're going to be reading the next two readings is because there are religions that, and even in Judaism with the people that thought that God actually condenses himself. Um, and the idea of condensing himself is to be able to fit into the finite. And the early sages of Kabbalah were very much adamant against that um, because you cannot apply any of these characteristics and um, illustrations on God. So let's see. That's why we have this uh, statement right over here. Even Biyah you, is free of physical connotation unless the lowest one, which is Asiya, which is action. Let let me just explain a little bit what I mean by this. Physical and spiritual are two different realms. They're not they're not in the same realm whatsoever. And you don't even have to go to spiritual and physical, even in our own senses. Take the sense of touch. The sense of touch is a sensory thing that you have in your fingers or other parts of your body, your toes, whatever. And you can touch a surface and you can feel if the surface is smooth, if the surface is rough, if the surface is hard, if the surface is soft, right? Take an intellectual idea. Can you apply the same sensory description to an intellectual idea. You can borrow terms, but it doesn't mean the same thing. You can't say, okay, an intellectual idea is, has, is a hard surface or it's a soft surface. Or you can't say that it has cracks in it or not. You can speak in the intellectual level, but you can't apply anything physical to it. So if somebody says, I I can't feel your thought with my hands. It doesn't make any sense. The Altareva writes in Tanya, anyone that says such a thing will be laughed out of court. You can say, my mind can't conceive of what you're saying. I can't contemplate what you're saying. But to say that there's a sensory touch to it is not possible because physical and spiritual are two different worlds. So if we're speaking about physical and spiritual within our own world, that there is such a distinction between them and difference how much more so when we're speaking about the world of God. The world of God cannot be understood on our level. So we use ideas that reflect it in order for our mind to be able to absorb it. But we realize that there's much more to it. Um, I was studying, I'm studying with a, a certain individual once a week. We study a discourse from the fifth Chabad Rebbe and the last pages that we discussed, he actually addresses it. And he says that when someone studies, let's say even Hasidus and Kabbalah, and they're enamored with the intellectual ideas, they become so involved in it that they forget the godliness that's in it. They forget the divine that's in it. And the proof to it is the fact that it has no spiritual effect on them. It doesn't change them. But if they realize that there is a godliness to it and there's holiness to it and it talks to the soul, it would create some sort of change within them. So we have to be very careful how we approach these spiritual ideas. It, it's quite apparent in the writings of Kabbalah that 
there was a big discussion about this symptom that was just introduced. And the reason we don't feel it as a, as a controversy is because when they translated in English, they translated in English according to the readings that we're going to read soon. But if you read it in the original, there's a word that Rabbi Chaim Vital wrote that threw everybody off. Because he doesn't say that he contracted his infinite light the way we read it in English. But if you look in the Hebrew, it says, Simsum Atzmo Ha'en Saf. He reduced himself, the Ein Sof. And that's a term that can be understood either that he himself reduced the Ein Sof or that he reduced himself. And for that reason, the Kabbalistic scholars came along and said, don't you dare think that he reduced himself. So we're going to do these two readings, then we'll go to the issue at hand. Page 145, text 2a. Those who, this is written by one of the frame, famous Italian Kabbalistic scholars. Um, and by the way, something very interesting about the Italian scholars of that time, they wrote in parallel to theology and philosophy that was by the non-Jews as well, which was in a Q&A, questions and answers. So you have the questions that are asked, and then you have the answers. This is one of the answers. So just if anyone looks at the original book, you'll see there's questions and answers. Those who wish to understand the tzimtzum in a literal manner will be led to beliefs that contradict most of the fundamentals of our faith. First of all, we were explicitly taught, to whom do you compare God and what likeness can you arrange for him? If I, In other words, that there is no image to God. There is no physical attribute that can be applied to God. If, however, you take the symptom literally, you indeed are you are indeed imposing an image on God, an encompassing circle, an empty space, and a straight channel within that space. So you can't do it literally; it's conceptually. You have to conceptualize what does it mean a uh, uh, um, uh, place that is a circle, which means that it's infinite, filled with the light of the divine. What does it mean that it is concealed? What does it mean that there is a line that's in it? And we're soon going to see, actually, it illustrated, because the fifth Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Shalom Ber, actually writes it out in a beautiful way, and the video is actually going to help us as well. Text 2b. Additionally, the Zohar states numerous times that there is no place where he is not, from the highest level to the lowest level and in every direction. If you suggest that the Tzimtzum is literal, you're insinuating that there's a place devoid of him. For in this empty space, only a narrow channel descends. So what's he saying over here? What he's saying over here is that this, that the Arizal or his student is writing, that there was a void that was put into place that was in the Simpson Arishan in the first Simpson, doesn't literally mean that God wasn't there. But it means that it was concealed. But concealment means it's a one-way concealment. In other words, it's not that God didn't exist, but he concealed it, and we're soon going to illustrate it. But first, we have to understand that it's not to be taken literally. Rabbi Shneer Zaman of Liadi goes even further. Page 147, text 3. That Simpson does not mean that God's infinite light departed, God forbid, for in truth there's no place devoid of him, as it says in the Zohar. This principle is also expressed in the Midrash. Why did God choose to reveal himself to Moses within a thorn bush? To teach that there is no place devoid of God's presence, even a thorn bush. Instead, in this context, the meaning of Tzimtzum is that Orin Saf went from a state of revelation to one of concealment without departing at all. What does that mean? It went into a state of concealment, but it didn't depart. There's a funny joke that they have that uh, a police instructor was trying to see um, detectives. Who's going to be a potential detective? So, so he shows a profile picture. And um, he asks the guy, 
this is your suspect, how would you recognize it? So it's simple. He only has one eye. One eye because he saw the profile picture. So the instructor became very upset and he says to the second guy, he says to him, how would you recognize it? He says, oh, I would recognize it because he only has one ear. At this point, the instructor said, okay, let me give a chance for the third guy. Just to the third guy, how would you recognize him? He says, simple, he's wearing contact lenses. He says, okay, let me check that. That must be something. He goes out of the room. And actually, the guy was there, the one that they took the picture. And lo and behold, he has contact lenses. He comes back and he says, that is fantastic. I couldn't even notice it. How did you notice it? He says, why? If he only has one eye and one ear, he couldn't wear glasses. So add the contact. Okay. What happens is that um, when we uh, look at the tzimtzum and something is concealed, it doesn't mean that it's not there. The fact that we can't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But we're going to actually put it into words that we will be able to see. So follow me with uh, the, the slideshow right now, because this will be very helpful. The Tzimtzum. So first, there was a divine light that filled all of reality. In other words, if there is a reality of an existence, which the only existence at this point is the existence of God, but anything that emanates from God, what emanates is this infinite divine light, right? And that was revealed. And the reason that it's important that it was revealed is that theoretically, if there was a creature that was there, but there can't be a creature there because it's an infinite of an infinite infinite light of Hashem. But if there was a creature there, an entity there, that light would be totally revealed. So not only would the presence be there, it would be revealed that the consciousness would feel it, you would see it, you would touch it, it would be part of you. That's the divine light that was infinite. Then God contracted it. What does it mean God contracted it? God concealed it. And in that concealment, God projected a straight line. What is the straight line? There's a reason why it's called straight line. So we'll get to that in a minute. But what I want to focus before we go to the straight line is those two words, revealed and concealed. We're still going to see an example. Take, for instance, this professor like Einstein, that in his mind, for him, the ideas that are flowing are totally revealed, right? If somebody else was able to get into his mind, they would see that light emanating from his brain, that it is so powerful and so radiant that it is just amazing. However, in that light, in that powerful ideas, those powerful ideas that are in his mind, how would he take something from that mind and simplify it to the level that today's college kids or high school kids should be able to understand it? How would he do that? He couldn't? He'd write it down or speak it. What would he do before he writes it down or speaks it? First, he has to contemplate it. First of all, if he couldn't do it, then he wouldn't be a good teacher. The um, greatness of a good teacher is that they can take the abstract, difficult concepts and convey it in a way that everyone, or at least everyone that makes an attempt should be able to understand it. So what he has to do is he has to cool his brain for a minute and say, let me, let me not see this whole, um, e all the mathematical equations in the in the quick brightness that I see it, in the speed that I see it, let me freeze it a little bit and let me take one idea that I think that that idea can actually relate to the kids. So it's not a foreign idea, it's the same idea, but it's something that is severely reduced to the level that they can understand. That is the process of Simpson. We had a um, a great genius in Montreal who was the chief rabbi of Montreal. 
and he had a photographic memory. He had also a lot of depth of knowledge, but you could ask him anything in the Talmud and he knew exactly what page it was. He would finish the Talmud every seven years. He studied Maimana, he studied everything. He knew everything on his brain and his mind would work so fast. In fact, one of the young students who later became the chief rabbi of Tzfat asked him just as a joke, how many times does Rashi write the German Yiddish word Sibele? Because Rashi would sometimes translate in the Talmud a, a, a word, so either in French or in German, so people should be able to understand it. It was called Balash and Amzul, Balaz, in our spoken colloquial language. But Rashi sometimes would spell Sibila with a hey at the end and sometimes with an aleph. So he says, how many times did Rashi write Sibila in the Talmud? And how many times with a hey and an aleph? So he says, we're davening Mincha, I can't talk to you. So right after Mincha, uh, he came over to him. He didn't even go to the bookcase or anything. And he said six, five with an aleph, five with a hey and once with an aleph. You want to know where? Started shooting down each place. I remember that after, the, he used to come to the Rebbe's Fabrengen and sit behind the Rebbe. And he was so, he was quiet by the Rebbe. He wouldn't say a word. But after the Rebbe would walk out, he would sit down, stand with my father, and he would talk, and his mouth would speak 100 miles an hour. All of these ideas would come out that unless you were on the level of his level of erudition and his level of knowledge, you couldn't understand what he's saying. It was flowing so quick. But yet, he had the ability to teach yeshiva students. And what he would do is he would work on himself to quiet his brain down and then take out a piece of the Talmud that he wants to teach and say, how can I teach it to them that I can understand it? So the process was a two-step process. The first process was the concealment. He had to conceal the infinite light comparative to, to the students in his mind. And only after he concealed it can he reveal that part that he wanted to reveal. But what he revealed wasn't something new that didn't exist before. That, that concept was already there in his mind before. But because of the divine light that was in his brain that was functioning at a thousand miles an hour, that piece was also part of that whole big storm. By concealing from himself, not when I say concealing, it's not that he forgot the information, but quieting it down and then taking that idea, which is like a drop that reflects the whole ocean, and he was able to feed it to the students, he was able to reveal it. So it's a two-step process, concealment and then revealing. And what revealed was something that was very finite, measured, that he can understand. But it wasn't something new. And the Rebbe points out something very interesting. The Rebbe points out, that if a teacher is able to take that kind of abstract information and condense it to the level that students should be able to understand it, if the students are good students and they work with it and they grow with it, they will be able to eventually reveal within that limited idea the full richness that was in the idea of, of the teacher. Because it's not something which is separate, it's something which is, it's something that originated there but it is finite compared to the infinity that was in his mind. The same thing is what happened at the time of creation. The finite light and the infinite light was all mixed together. The finite idea, the ability to express, the God should express himself in the finite is there together with the infinite. As we said in the second class and everybody looked at me, that what's this all about? because you can't limit God. God has the ability to express himself in the finite and in the infinite, and they're both the same. But when the infinite is dominating, the finite assumes the character of the infinite. So the only way for the finite to be able to assume the character of its true being, of the finite and not the infinite, is by the withdrawal, so to speak, of the infinite light, to create the perception as if it's not there, but it's really there, but it's just concealed, and then to reveal that finite idea. But that finite idea, compared to the richness, is a tiny sliver. So for that reason, the Arizal's example is that it's just a straight, thin line. And that straight, thin line actually, it says, is a kav kotzer. It's a short kav. It's a, it doesn't have the length 
that the great light has. And the idea of the Kav is that as a top and as a bottom, it's the finite. Now, if we never learned about the infinity and we only learned about the Kav and we went from one level to another level, it would blow you away because compared to us, it's infinite. But compared to the true infinite, it is very finite. And this is the idea of what the Tzimtzum is. So what's very important is that there should be the Tzimtzum. Let's see how the Rebbe Rashab writes it, and then we'll play the video. Rabbi? Yeah. What was the impetus for the concealment? In order to reveal the finite. So it's God's desire was that there should be a finite world. And a, not only a finite world, but a finite world which is sort of um, in that consciousness as if God is hidden. And over there where we reveal godliness through the Torah and through the mitzvot that we do. So therefore, he had to do the concealment. The concealment, everything that happened from above to below was for the purpose of creating this physical world and to give us the Torah and the mitzvah. But this is the process, and we spelled it out in the first class. Let's look at page 149. This is taken actually from that series of discourses that I'm studying now with, with another um, person. And it's actually, we haven't reached this yet, so it's good that... Uh, we're we're talking about it. So he writes the following. Consider, this is from the Rebbe Rashab. The Rebbe Rashab, Rabbi Sholem Dovid, was called the Maimonides of Hasidic thought. So he says, consider the example of a teacher imparting information to students. The profound concept the teacher understands is incompatible with the student's mental abilities. True. The profound concept contains less significant elements that are compatible with the student's minds. You see, it has that finite concept was already there. Nevertheless, in the teacher's minds, these elements are filled with the profundity of the overall concept, and therefore they remain too deep to deliver to the students. The main obstacle here is that there is no distinction in the teacher's mind between the core of the concept and it's less significant elements. Consequently, if the teacher proceeds to transmit this knowledge to the students, the teacher will deliver the full profundity along with the less significant components. The students will understand none of it. The solution is for the teacher to conceal the entire concept, mentally pushing the whole idea aside to approach it anew. This is very pivotal here. It's very the pivoting here is that it's not that he it's not that he withdraws everything and just leaves the finite in place. Because if he withdraws everything, he leaves the finite in the place, the finite is still part impressed and a con continuation or a continuum of the infinite. So therefore, everything has to be concealed and he has to approach it anew. The teacher can now distinguish between the idea's cores and more superficial elements. The teacher can then deliver the transmittable details without flooding these elements with the overwhelming complexity of the concept. This gives you a little bit of an idea of a tzimtzum, but this is different than a regular tzimtzum when you have a concept that is not infinite. It's just difficult to understand. So then you do a real, a, a regular tzimtzum. The tzimtzum arishan, which is the first, the concealment. First, it's revealed in his mind. Then he has to conceal it. And then he has to reproject the, the finite idea, that is where there is the jump and the shift from the infinity to the finite, which the Arizal says is the Tzimtzum Arisha. And give you an example the way um, we talk about it. So remember these two words. There's something which is called Gilui, which means revelation, the godliness that is apparent, and then there is concealment. In Hebrew, it's called helem. Concealment. That is, it's present, but not apparent. And that's what happens. So let's look at the parable. A genius has an abstract idea that's beyond, beyond ordinary students. The abstract idea has a minor implication that is relatable. The minor implication is still part of the unattainable idea, right? The abstract idea is removed from the genius consciousness thinking. The minor implication becomes discoverable. He now realizes it and now can be shared. And this is what we learned until now, right? Makes sense. What's the analog? 
an infinite light filled all of reality with no room for finite expression. God's infinity includes the power to be finite because God is not limited. So God has the ability to be infinite and finite. But that power of finite was still part of the divine infinity. It was still because of the great light that was there. God concealed his infinite light, and through this he was able to project his finite power into the space of concealment. Now, um, I want to make one more reading before we read the video. The statement that I want to make is a question that we asked once before, and I gave it in a speech probably a few in the Shabbat Bereshit, but it's very important here as well. We talked about it in one of the classes. I can't remember which one because it's not in the text here. But this is an introduction to the next reading. When God created the light, he says, let there be light, and there was light. Right? That's in the beginning of Genesis. What does it say after that? And God saw the light, and he said he had to separate the light and the darkness. God separated the word, the Hebrew word there is Vayavdel, which comes from the word Havdalah. What is Havdalah? To separate. Havdalah we do Saturday night to separate from the holiness of Shabbat to the mundane nature of the week. So God had to separate from the light to the darkness. So the question is asked, why did God have to separate light from darkness? If there's light, darkness has no place, can't exist. If there's an absence of light, then there's darkness. Why did God have to actively separate the light from the darkness? Remember we talked about this before? Why did God have to separate? Not only that Rashi brings down to say that the light and the darkness was conf confusing. They were mixed together, and it caused confusion in the world. And we talked about it as an example of our time, that light is dark and dark is light. But let's go back to the way it's in the origin. The origin is God had to separate between the light and the darkness. Why did he have to se separate between the light and the darkness? So the darkness is not really darkness. The Rebbe Rashab says the darkness is really light, but light that can illuminate darkness. What kind of light can illuminate darkness? A light that is simplified and condensed that it should be able to resonate within the world. If you're going to take an infinite light or even a strong laser light, it doesn't illuminate the darkness. It blinds people. It does. That's not called illumination. So in order to have a light that is able to illuminate the darkness, it has to be a softer light. And that light is called Choshech, is called darkness. Having said that, we can now understand the Tzimtzum as well. If you give a look in text 4b, he says the above parable, allow, the parable that he gave from the student and the teacher and the student, allows us to appreciate the concept of Tzimtzum. Before the Tzimtzum, God's ability to express finite divinity was part and parcel of his prevailing infinity. In other words, the finite was part and parcel of the infinite because God is infinite and not limited. Therefore, he can express himself both in the infinite and the finite. Because the entire theme of Ein Sof before the Tzimtzum is to reflect the infinite, infinite capacity of God's essence and to resemble it. So that was the light. The Tzimtzum enabled, and here's the key word, the Havdalah the separation between these two powers of expression. And that's what the Torah is talking about, Levayavdel, that God was able to separate <clears throat> the finite from the infinite. But how did he do it? First, by concealing everything and then re-revealing the finite light. So the Tzimtzum in motion was as an empty space, as if an empty space emerged, but that was sort of as if it was an illusion. And over there, God created or God projected this light, which is the finite. And in this finite light, you have the world of Atzilut, you have the Keter, you have the Tohu that we talked about last week, you have all the high levels, and then you also have the whole, all the all levels, because the differences of the levels can only be in the finite. 
So this is a huge drastic change which came along through the Simpson. This only explains the jump from the infinite to the finite. It doesn't explain the jump from Atzilut to, to Bria and Yisir. That we will see soon. But in order to get us through this, we're now going to play... A Welcome to our fifth video on the world of Kabbalah, a journey through the mystical layers of the Kabbalistic system. We previously described the disparity between God's infinite light and the ten sefirot of Atzilut that have definitions and distinctions, and therefore limitations. How can absolute infinite divinity give way to a finite form of divinity, the ten sefirot? The transition cannot be gradual because it's impossible for infinity to devolve into something finite. So what enabled such a drastic leap? The good news is that 16th century Rabbi Yitzhak Luria explained this puzzle. The bad news is that it's a complex topic, so we'll just give a sample here. The idea is called Tzimtzum, which means contraction. God contracted his infinite light, disrupting its infinity to support the emergence of the finite spherot. The Kabbalists used metaphoric imagery. God pushed aside the light to form an empty void, into which he beamed the single straight light of illumination that devolved into the cosmos. Now, if that's not mysterious, nothing is. So let's clarify. The Tzimtzum did not remove God from anywhere or anything. So what did it achieve? Well, if you recall, in an earlier video, we described a scientist struggling to share an abstract, complex theory with teenage minds. He's forced to pause and rethink his presentation. After identifying a relatable detail within the theory, he shares just that detail with the students, who are blown away at the genius of it. It took the scientists time and effort to identify the detail. Why is that? Because the detail was lost in the forest of the complex theory. It didn't have its own identity. So how did he identify it? He stopped focusing on the theory. The idea remained in his mind, but he decreased the intensity of his focus, which created the mental space to hone in on a minor detail. That's the Tzimtzum. Nothing is impossible for God. He has both the ability to be infinite and to be finite. The difference is that his infinity is naturally revealed. That's the infinite light. While his ability to be finite is lost in the background, like the scientific detail overlooked in the context of a complex theory. Just as the scientist reduced his focus on the entire theory to allow a detail to become visible, so did God reduce the focus on his infinite power to allow his finite power to operate. So when the Kabbalists say that God made an empty space for creation, it's not actual space and it's not actually empty. It's a shift between two layers of divine focus. And when they talk of a single straight line, they mean God's ability to be finite, which is what allowed the Ten Sefirot, finite forms of divinity, to emerge. How is that relevant to us? We exist thanks to the process of Tzimtzum. But the Tzimtzum is not a true withdrawal, just a concealment of focus. So even when we feel that God is withdrawn from our world, it pays to remember that we remain within God's infinite light, although it's concealed from our perception. Knowing that makes it easier to personally relate to God. And the fact that God initiated this drastic step of Tzimtzum to make space for our existence should inspire us to create space for His presence in our lives. After all, it's just a matter of focus. We want to give one disclaimer. 
the one piece of the video which um, is not exactly accurate, and I don't want to go against the JLI, is that it wasn't that everything was reduced and it, what remained was a finite, but as we just read before, everything was actually concealed, and with that, there was the allowance for the reprojection of that finite. So this is a very, very important thing that we read. Now, we're going to go and uh, talk about the transition from Atzilut, which is already finite, but it is a finite that is way beyond the um, reality of Bia, because when we talk about when we talk about the world of Atzilut, the world of Atzilut, we said, is God's consciousness. In God's consciousness, nothing else exists. We don't exist. We don't even love God because we don't even exist to love God. The only existence that exists is of God, even if it's in the world of finite. Once you go out of the realm of Atzilut, all of a sudden, we exist. A consciousness exists. So therefore, the jump and the leap from Atzilut to Biyah in certain ways, is no different from the infinite to the finite. It's just a different kind of leap. And for that, um, Hasidus and Kabbalah speak about not the tzimtzum, even though there is a tzimtzum, but there is something which is called a screen, or it's called a parsa, a curtain. What is this parsa? So, Rather than reading inside, I want to give you an example, and then we will um, be able to um, understand it. Let's say you're in your house, and it's very bright in the house, and you want to have some of the light, so you put up a screen, but you let's say you put up window shades, better than a screen. But you don't totally close the window shades because if you close the window shades, it'll be dark in the house. And you want to have some light. So you arrange the window shade in such a way that it should block out the intensity and it should only allow a little bit of light. We do this all the time. You have, if you're in your bedroom and you want to read or in your living room and dining room and you have the window shade and it's totally open, you can't read because it's too bright. So you close it a little bit. And what it does is it reduces the light and when it reduces the light, you're able to get a little bit of it, and then you can see it. So that's Simpson. may not be the first Simpson, but it's Simpson. The similarity between that and the first and the main Simpson is because, in as we saw in the video, Einstein wasn't coming up with a new idea. It was the same idea, but it was just one detail that was applicable or explainable to the students, but it was a very reduced idea. That's the idea of Simpson. But then there's another way of blocking out the light. And blocking out the light is by using a screen. And the screen blocks it out and filters it. So then the light that comes in is not only that it's reduced, but it's actually reprojected in a different way. It could be through a color, it could, it's darker, it's not, it's not the same, it's a reflection of the original light. One example of understanding it is through examples. Let's say if the teacher was explaining something and explaining the concept but just reduced it, it's the same concept. But let's say if the teacher uses an example, a parable. So the parable is a separate story. It's like a garment that's something which is totally different. And when the teacher tells you the parable, they're hoping that from the parable, you'll be able to see what the hidden message is that they're trying to convey. One of the most ex interesting examples is with Shlomo HaMelech. Shlomo HaMelech wrote the book Shir HaShirim. What is Shir HaShirim? The Song of Songs. Ask anyone that studied Shir HaShirim, describe what it is, they will tell you it's the ultimate book of love and romance, that there hasn't been such a great book of romance with such descriptions of love that has ever been written. It's between a bride and a groom. And it's pretty explicit in many, many ways. And it speaks about the physical beauty, the spiritual beauty, 
and it's it's really romantic, and a lot of people love it. Anila dodi dodi li. I'm to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. Comes along the Talmud and says, "Why would Shlomo Melech write a book of poetry? What was he trying to convey? He wasn't a poet, and he wasn't a novelist, and he wasn't a romantic necessarily to convey romance. Shlomo Melech was known as someone until the later years that he in, that he introduced." ideas and concepts of how to study Torah. He introduced some of the laws in the Torah that we have to live with today in regards to Shabbat or regards to the daily rituals. Believe me, it was the Shlomo HaMelech and his best. But one of the things that he wanted to do was convey the love between God and Israel, between God and the Jewish people. So if the only way that he can bring out the love, that we should understand the love, is by using the example of the love between a bride and a groom. So the value of it is because since the love between a bride and a groom is something that resonates with us and makes a lot of sense, and it's something that we enjoy and we wish we have it in our life as well, or if not, we wish to see it in our kid's life or people that we really love, that they should have it. So it, it talks to us. So therefore, if we are in tune with it, it can already take the deeper concepts of the love of God and Jewish people and bring it down into a relevant, applicable way to us as well. The problem, however, is, is that some people will only get stuck with the example. And you get stuck with the example, so then you only think about the example and not about what the example is trying to teach you. Because the example is a screen that not only filters, but it blocks it, hopefully to be able to reveal what's beneath it and what's beyond it so um the screen is almost something that's outside of it it's unlike the reduced concept that the teacher gives which is the reduced light like you have from the window shades but it's actually a separate garment but which is a screen but through this you hope you should be able to understand it and the light that comes out of it is different because when we're thinking about the love of god after studying shira shirim we're constantly thinking about it in human terms, right? Because the Shira Shirim speaks in human physical terms. Until you study Hasidus and Kabbalah, and they open up your eyes to see the mystical ideas of Shira Shirim, then you can see it in the abstract. But if you don't have that, even if you know that it's talking about God, you're starting to think about the love between God and the Jewish people in very physical terms. So this is a light that emanates through um, through the Parsa. Let's see how the third Chabad Rebbe explains it in text 5 on page 153. In his Eitz Chaim, Rabbi Chaim Vital discusses a dividing curtain between Atzilut and Bria. This curtain is the concealing garment that enables the creation of entities with a sense of independence. Remember that Atsilos is God's consciousness. Bri Yitzira is our own consciousness, which is a pretty big jump. So what enables us to jump from God's consciousness into the consciousness of something which is ourselves? That is what's called the parsa, the screen. It is comparable to a physical screen that conceals light. Although some light succeeds in piercing the barrier, that light is merely a secondary product of the original light. Okay? Other sources explain further that this parsa, which we call a curtain, is akin to a, to a parable's words, which entirely conceal the profound message of the Analev. For example, consider the parable cited by King Solomon. He vested supernal secrets in the mundane ideas that hide the mystical truths. One who reads these parables gains a mere glimmer that is incomparable to the core supernal secrets. Another example that the Tzemach Tzedek uses is the sun and the moon. The moon doesn't have its own light. The moon receives all of its light from the sun. But the reprojection of the light that comes from the moon is like a secondary, totally different kind of light than the light that you get from the sun. It's totally softer. It's not as harsh. It's not as strong or bright. So also, it's like the concept of the parson. 
So um, the concept is that the parsa is a almost like a physical barrier. So the light is altered. In the tzimtzum, and and the tzimtzum is just that it's reduced. Okay, I want to go back here a second. Again, if we look at the ten sfirot, all of the ten sfirot that we've discussed in Atzilut, we discuss it in human terms. We speak about intelligence. We speak about comprehension. We speak about... Um, um, we speak about the compassion, which is personalization. We speak about kindness. We speak about discipline. But in Atzilut, we remember that it's all about God. It's not our wisdom. It's God's wisdom. Once you go out of Atzilut and you discuss it in our level, the way we understand it, all that you have is the concept itself of comprehension, creativity, and, and all of that. So you forget that it's God. That's the concept of Parsa. I want to give you one more uh, piece over here, and then we'll go into how we apply it and what Simpson means to us and why this is so important. This actually, what I'm going to tell you now, is for the purpose of understanding, A, the reverence for the divine, and secondly, what effort God has made to reduce the divinity and the light of the divine to get to this physical world. So Moses, if you think about Moses, that Moses was an Ashama, a soul of Atzilut, and he came into this world, the world was not an obstruction for godliness. He saw godliness through the world. He didn't see, when he looked at people, he saw their souls. He didn't even see their bodies. He saw the divine composition of everything. And therefore, he was frustrated when the people came to him and asked him for physical needs. He couldn't understand it. You have heavenly manna. What else do you need? But because he was a faithful shepherd, so therefore he provided it for them. What's the difference of the Atzilut to the Bria? Even Bria, which is the highest level. This is not in this text, but in the text that we read before from the Rebbe Rashab, when he gives the example of the teacher and the student, about five pages before that, he explains the following. He explains something fascinating. He says, in davening, we talk about the different levels of angels before we recite the Shema. And we talk about their deep, cultivated, pure understanding of godliness. Till as we learned in the past, that the highest level are the srafim, right? The ones that get burnt in their desire for God. And they can say, Kaddosh, 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 they recognize the holiness of God. Because in they live in the world of Bria, and in the world of Bria, even though they feel their consciousness, but they feel their consciousness as it's attached and dependent on God, and all they want to do is cleave to God. Okay, that's very high level. Now, you would think that the reason that we read it before the Shema is to us get inspired. If the angels are so inspired, we should also be inspired. The truth is that the al Rebbe writes in Tanya that there's a deeper reason why we read about it, to say that as holy as the angels are, that's not where the divine desire is. The divine desire is in the souls, that we should do mitzvahs. So what's so special about the souls? So the Rebbe Rashab says that the soul that is in the world of Bria and Gan Eden is on a much higher level than the angels. And the perception of the divine wisdom that the soul has is the perception that exists in Atzilut. That's why it's called the Garden of Eden. Because in the Garden of Eden, the illumination there, even though it's in the world of Bria, is Atzilut. That, that's what distinguishes Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, from the rest of Bria. That in Bria itself, there's a Garden of Eden. You follow me with that? So in the section of Bria, there is a place called Gan Eden, and over there the perception is the perception which is divine. Now, he says, make no mistake, the perception of the divine that the soul has there has no relationship whatsoever to human intelligence. Nothing whatsoever. It's totally divine intelligence. Because if the human mind can understand it. That's the first proof that it's not divine intelligence. 
because there's no way the human mind can understand divine intelligence. Divine intelligence is abstract in its entirety. It's a totally different kind of existence and a totally different kind of wisdom than the wisdom that we have. The wisdom that we have is a wisdom that is filtered through physical terms. It's is filtered through the physical body. So we can't perceive something that's outside of it. Everything has to be through the prism or the abstract of the physical. With the souls that are enjoying Atzilut, it's a totally different kind of intelligence, even though it's also called Chachma, wisdom, but it's, it's a different kind of wisdom. This is a wisdom which is a wisdom which is something that the mind can understand. The wisdom of Atzilut is God's wisdom. And this is the difference between the two slides. In the truth, when we are using the words of wisdom and understanding and knowledge and we're saying kindness and discipline and strength and all the other um, attributes of God, we, we're speaking in human terms. We have to remember we're speaking about God. We're not speaking about us. We are trying to understand it in human terms, so we're giving human descriptions to it. But to say that we truly understand it is absolutely not so. And that's why we can get lost and think about it only in human terms. And this is why it's important to have that. And But what causes that separation from the divine and God's consciousness to our own? That's that parson. That's that screen. The screen is so powerful that it reprojects the light. And that's why I like this sun and the moon is a very good example. If someone never saw the sun, if somebody lived all winter in northern Alaska and all they saw was the moon and they saw the full moon, they saw a half moon and they come and said, I know what light is about. I can describe it exactly. I measured it. And then they're taken out of that environment and they're thrown into an environment, which is the summer of Alaska. It's a totally different kind of light. It's not, it's incomparable. And as incomparable as that is, it's even more incomparable, the distinction between Atsilut and Bria. Atsilut, and remember, is God's consciousness. So it's it's so removed from the physical, or even, when I say physical, I mean even the spiritual mind. Even if one person, a person will fast day and night and refine themselves to try, to, while the soul is in the body, to try to understand the divine at that level, the way it is pure godliness, it's not going to happen because it has to be filtered through their physical brain. It's only when the soul leaves the body and enters into Gan Eden that they're actually able to perceive the divine in its true reality because they're not no longer filtered with the physical body. They're no longer, it's no longer filtered by the physical body, by the physical perception. And they have a better appreciation of the divine even more than the angels because they're on a much higher level than the angels. So what set, what creates that divide between God's consciousness and the divine, the way it's in Atsilus, to the consciousness, the way it is in Bria, that's not a tzimtzum, that is a parsa. And in a way, a parsa is much harsher than the tzimtzum because the parsa actually blocks it out. Okay? Now we're going to go to the last few minutes. This is going to be the easy part. That's called avoda. Now we have to say, how? what does this mean to us in Simpson? What does it mean to us to reduce our presence? So it could be to a good teacher, that a good teacher has to realize that it's not about showing off how much they know and how much knowledge they have, because as they say, if all you're trying to do is make an impression, that's exactly the impression you make. A good teacher is not interested in themselves, they're interested in seeing to it that the recipients understand the material and that they can take that material and, and personalize it and put it in their life. Then you have another kind of symptom that's necessary. And that's when you have someone that is self-centered, a little narcissistic, as you give a look on page 156. Those who are self-obsessed and narcissistic become engrossed in their desires and wishes and completely forget about God. This is written by the previous Rebbe. Similarly, their self-obsession precludes loving others. Their self-love generates divisiveness because it doesn't allow them 
to tolerate others. They think that whatever someone else says or does is directed against them. There was an incident that well illustrates this point. A fellow who happened to be a tremendous scholar, it wasn't a simpleton, someone that was a great scholar, and well-versed in the Torah, once had a private audience with my great-grandfather, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Lubavitch, that was the third Chabad Rebbe. Rebbe, he complained, the others are stepping all over me in the study hall. They do not appreciate what I have to say. They do not behave properly towards me. And they almost do the exact opposite of my opinion. The Holy Rebbe replied, your ego expands throughout the entire study hall. Wherever anyone steps is bound to be on you. <laughs> right? The Rebbe goes further and says um, that this is not only in the physical, it's the Holy um, you know, in, in non-religious, I shouldn't say, in non-spiritual settings, you can always find it. You can come to a meeting and there's one person that dominates the meeting and they only want to be heard and nobody else can be heard. A manager who micromanages every deed that the employee does. Um, a family member that just imposes their opinion and never wants to hear another person's opinion. But it could also happen in spirituality. And that's what the Rebbe says in text 6b. You will notice that the above story mentions that the individual, remember it was a scholar, felt like people were stepping all over him in the study hall. This is um, highly in, in a highly instructive detail because a whole designated for Torah study is considered to be a miniature holy temple. Divinity is more accurately present and perceptible in a place filled with Torah study, similar to the presence of divinity within the holy temple. Despite that, this individual succeeded in maintaining a bloated ego even in such a holy place. The detail of the story was included to underscore that knowledge alone without working on self-refinement is woefully insufficient, so much so that one's ego will infiltrate even a miniature sanctuary. This proves the indispensability of avoda, the internal work of character uh, and refinement. So we're talking about taming the emo, ego. So over there, there has to be the um, a little bit of a symptom. And this is what we're going to read in text number seven. And then we're going to get, right after that, we'll answer the first question that we asked at the beginning of the class. What was the first question that we asked? Anyone? Why is there so much adversity in the life? And how is it that we don't crumble? from this adversity. And that will be answered um, not with this reading, but the reading after that. Because here the Al-Tareba writes, Kamayim Laponim Laponim. It's actually taken from where? Shira Shirin. Reciprocation is a natural response. God said, it, say, figuratively speaking, his great infinite light and concealed it. He did this do for his love to us to raise us up to him for love induces one to restrict oneself to another. When we reflect this deeply on this deeply, our souls will spontaneously be ignited to reciprocate. We will feel motivated to forsake everything in order to cleave to him. So again, it goes into this humility business that when we are humble, it provides space for others around us, and then it allows God into our life. Now we're going to answer the question because Simpson predated uh, creation which means that it came first. Of course, there was the first divine light, but then as we read in that reading that as soon as God had the desire to create, what did he do? He didn't first immerse, bring out a light, immerse the world with light or infuse the world with light, but what was the first thing he did? Concealment. And this is actually hinted in the way the Torah describes the creation. What came first? Darkness. Night, and then came day. Why is darkness before night? So the Mithil Rebbe explains on page 160 in text 8a. The verse says there was evening, and then there was morning, and that made one day. That was the first day, the same thing was the second day, the third day. This verse informs us that there is no day without a night that precedes it. Why must it be so? Why does a day not exclusively consist of daylight hours or perhaps just night hours? Why must it include both evening and morning? And why must night precede the day? 
the root of the matter is that at the source of creation, there was evening before morning. That is, darkness preceded light, but the tzimtzum preceded the sharing of God's kindness. This darkness-like com combination extends to all the worlds, including, uh, including our world, where night precedes day. What does this mean? No pain, no gain. The Jewish people became an independent people and were worthy of receiving the Torah only after they went through the excruciating experience of Egypt. Why was that? It wasn't just to help them appreciate freedom, but it was to refine them. As it says that they went through the refinery of gold or the refinery of metal. Um, the way God created the world. And by the way, I, I want to skip ahead for a second, then we'll go back. One of the things that it says in the time of Mashiach, it says, kayom ya'ir. Laila kayom ya'ir, that the night will be as bright as the day. The moon will be full at all times. It won't be cyclical anymore. Why? Because the whole idea of Tzimtzum will be gone. Why will Tzimtzum be gone? Because the whole idea of creation is that we will re-inject the infinite light in the finite world and they will live in harmony and you will be able to appreciate, you will be able to see as it says that the glory of God will be revealed and all of the eyes, even the flesh eyes, will see godliness. They will see godliness unfiltered. Not only that, but in the second stage of the coming of Mashiach, which is the Olam Haba, the world to come, which is the greatest level, it'll be as if it was even greater than before the creation, before the Tzimtzum. So this is not a permanent state of being. This is a state of Galut. But in the state of Galut, anything good comes only after something that is difficult and harsh. And we see that in our own life. One more reading. If you go look at text 8b. The Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab continues, we observe the same pattern reflected in the affairs of the world, whereby individuals do not achieve growth in wealth, leadership, building a family, study, or any other accomplishment with first, without first experiencing humiliation, pain, loss, and the like. Even when it comes to prayer, it says that when we pray before God, in order for someone to be able to experience the divine light reverberating through their soul, and they feel this thirst and this 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 tremendous elation, it can only come when there is this first, the bitterness and the sense of self-worth, no, no self-worth before God. And the Alta Rebbe writes about that as well. For example, individuals engaged in study will not arrive to a complete understanding of the subject without, without much toil and stress. Feeling distant from understanding and tempted to despair from mastering the subject. Indeed, the Talmud states in the Tractate of Gitin, page 43a, one does not understand the statements of Torah without first being mistaken. We observe the same in earning a livelihood, whereby we succeed only after putting forth great effort and enduring much pain, even feeling despair. Only thereafter do we find profit and great blessing. So what was the idea of the Tzimtzum? The idea of the Tzimtzum was the concealment for the sake of revelation. Just as the great teacher who's concealing the idea from his students is not for the purpose of blocking it out from them, but only because that's the only way to reveal it. And through this, they can grow. The same thing is the way Hashem created in the time before Mashiach comes, that any kind of great revelation comes only after there is concealment. And that is how we deal with adversity. When we deal with challenging times, we never despair. We know that the darker the concealment means, the greater the light that comes behind it. And we have to be able to see it. And believe me, um, when you speak to people that lived through the 20s and the 30s in the Soviet Union, when the society at that time all embraced the, um, the virtues of communism, and belittle Judaism and religion, people there thought it was all over, it's finished. And it was a very, very big struggle. But yet, after that struggle, a great light emerged even greater than before. And 
I have to say that this is true about our situation right now. One can easily fall into despair if they read the news, if they see what's going on, not only in Israel, but the neighboring countries and all the statements, and then you see what's going on in this country, and you feel overwhelmed by the level of anti-Semitism, you see all the characters that you respected or believed in, that all of a sudden they have become your enemy, and it can cause people to fall into despair. But remember, that is the darkness before a greater revelation. There'll be a greater insight. There'll be a greater level of divine truth that will come in the world as, as a corollary to that. The previous Rebbe made a very famous um, statement. I'm going to put it up here. Now we know why darkness comes before light. And in Judaism, in Judaism, um, the night comes before the day. The previous Rebbe in 1927 was arrested and subjected to tremendous torture. Him and his people, but him especially, physically beaten, humiliated, and sentenced to death. And at the time that he spent in the Soviet prisons was most excruciating. In fact, he aged from it. At one point, they didn't want to let him put on tefillin. And he was able to grab his talent and fill, and he was putting it on as he was climbing a metal ladder to go to the next story. And the KGB agent saw it, got so upset that he kicked him in his stomach, and he had a metal buckle that cut his stomach open, and he fell down and ha almost had a concussion and was wounded. He he, he was in it, and this is the great Rebbe. This is his picture that was taken after that when he recovered a few years later in Riga, Latvia. So the people asked him later when he came out to Latvia and he said, that, would you ever want to experience it again? He said, if someone would offer to sell me a single moment of additional suffering for a billion dollars, I would not buy. But if someone would offer to purchase a single moment of my past suffering for a billion dollars, I would not sell. Because he felt that he grew from that and it opened up new resources within himself that he himself didn't realize that he had. It's very powerful. It's very, very powerful. But it's the truth. It's not that he enjoyed the suffering. He didn't want to suffer. And he didn't want to see anyone else suffer. But on the other hand, he said, if you're going to take away how my life was enriched from that and how I see life in a different way, I wouldn't want to sell it either for a billion dollars. It's a very, very powerful statement. And we should internalize that statement now as well, even though we are in a period of stress and suffering. And I would say to a certain point, misery as well, since October 7th. Um, I have to speak honestly about myself and people that I know. Um, our sleep has not been the same. Our eating has not been the same. Our peace of mind has not been the same. And it's not so much because we're worried over here. It's because the whole thing of everything that's going around in the world, and especially in Israel. But we know that something tremendous is going to happen. First of all, the unity that emerged from it. But secondly, there's going to be something much greater that's going to happen. And when we're going to look at, back at it, we will see what we have learned from it, even though we don't want it. We say to God every day, don't bring us to a test. So what have we learned tonight? We've learned tonight that infinite to finite doesn't happen automatically with a snap of a finger. There's a process called the tzimtzum. And the tzimtzum actually, that concealment, by the way, that momentary concealment is the source for darkness in the world. That momentary concealment, even though it doesn't mean that God is not there, that is the source of the galut. What does it say in the galut? It says in, uh, it says in the end of the Devarim. Haster, aster. God says, I will hide, double hide myself. When he says hide, it doesn't mean that I will be absent, that I will leave, but I will give the appearance as if I'm not there. So the fact that there are times that there's such misery that you feel as if God is not there when God is there, but that he's hiding, that all originated in the Simpson. It came about through the Simpson. The Simpson allowed for that to happen. And the purpose of the Simpson was for a revelation that we should be able to receive, and through it we should grow. Not only the Simpson, but even when it led to the Parsa, which is the screening, which even creates a subset of lights, 
even that is for the purpose of growth that we should be able to grow because the entire purpose of the creation was that we in this world should be able to do a mitzvah. And I want to finish. Those angels that we talked about, and we learned it in today's Tanya, all of the higher worlds receive their elevation from a single mitzvah that we do. And if we do it right, if we don't do it right, the elevation is not there. That's why we measure. It has to be exactly this way, that way. But they all have the height and they get an elevation. The worlds cannot get an elevation from the angels. The worlds can't get an elevation. The worlds can't get an elevation from all the divine life that's there. The only entity or species that has the ability to create elevation for the higher worlds, for the angels, for the souls above, is us in the physical bodies. So when we're in the physical bodies, we have a choice. Are we utilizing the time to help them elevate, to be able to bring the fulfillment? Or are we just selfishly absorbed or self-absorbed in our needs and what we're eating and what we're drinking and what vacation I'm taking or what my neighbor said? And then what happens? They don't have their elevation. Actually, they have their descent because it's all dependent on us. And the only way that this can happen is through the tzimtzum. The Alta Rebbe writes in chapter 36 that all the higher worlds had a descent in order for this world to be created because this is where God's intention is. It's in the souls and the body. When the soul leaves the body, what does it lament? Even though it's coming back to perceive godliness, it laments that it doesn't have the ability to fulfill God's desire and to bring elevation. Therefore, the survivors have that ability. So when we're doing a mitzvah, not only are we doing a mitzvah for ourselves, we're doing a mitzvah for the loved ones that were close to us that are already in the world to come, that they're already in Ghanaian. So when we do a mitzvah with them in mind, then we cause an elevation to them that they couldn't get on their own. Okay, um, I just have to read. Is there a limit to the suffering? Absolutely, yes. Um, is revelation understood in the re rear view mirror? No, it will be seen in the front mirror. You will actually see it in front of you. In the windshield, it's going to be there like a deer jumping on you. The revelation will be there. It's not in the in any other way. Anyways, very good. Thank you very much. And we will see you next week. We'll come to class number six, but that will be again on Tuesday night. So stay tuned for that. Thank you very, very much. Lesson five. The Great Concealment. One second. One. One second. The human tendency for self-absorption. Okay, what were you saying? So God contracts and conceals himself so that our existence becomes possible, but then reveals himself.